Well, good evening, everybody. I'm Joshua Haberski. I'm the executive director and also our lead for federal government affairs. I'm joined by my colleague, Glenn Loop, uh, who runs all of our state affairs. Uh, Glenn and I are kind of the tag team in-house duo for uh, the Premium Cigar Association Government Affairs. Uh, we work with a couple of consultants as well as some of the other associations in uh, all levels of government, local, state, federal, and international to advance uh, specialty tobacco retailing, small business issues, and premium cigars. Um, we're going to start tonight by talking a little bit about what the federal uh, outlook looks like, and I think we'll be a little bit more informed on what that outlook likes, uh, looks like tomorrow evening uh, or even a couple days from now. Uh, but, you know, one of the questions that we've been fielding, and this is our fourth and final regional advocacy training, or, you know, what does um, an administration, a Harris administration look like? What does a Trump administration look like for the cigar industry um, and, uh, you know, the congressional makeup? Um, worst case scenario is a democratic trifecta where, uh, you know, you have a president Harris plus a democratic Senate and a democratic house. Um, we had, uh, in the beginning of president Biden's term, you had that trifecta. Um, and that was the, uh, or that was one of the biggest concerns that we had about the tax increases, uh, on premium cigars being raised. Um, that was part of the Build Back Better budget. We were able to get that out um, because there were a lot of House Democrats that were in small business di districts that stepped out up, uh, the Congressional Black Caucus in particular. Um, so, you know, that if, is, I think, our most concerning scenario from a tax perspective. Um, that provision is actually in something called the Mamas Act. It's about maternal health, and it takes all tobacco products at the same threshold as cigarettes and doubles it. Um, so that's where you get anywhere from 400% tax increase to 600% tax increase on cigars and pipe tobacco. So, um, you know, that's kind of what we've been guarding against. We've been supporting a lot of candidates, uh, you know, in the House and the Senate that are pro-small business, pro-cigar on both sides of the aisle. Um, we don't endorse or uh, have the resources really to uh, spend in the presidential race although we did participate in both the Democratic National Convention and the Republican National Convention uh, to make sure that cigars were top of mind. We partnered with the Cigar Association of America. And Glenn and I also hosted an event for uh, almost 400 state legislators at the National Conference of State Legislators in Louisville, Kentucky. So we've been really asserting that message across the board. In a Harris administration, I think another challenge that we could see is um, the flavored cigar rule coming back, uh, the ban on flavored cigars through the FDA. I think the uh, Food and Drug Administration would be a little bit more emboldened. Um, we are also monitoring nicotine, the threshold in, uh, of nicotine in all tobacco products, whether that would in, encompass cigars and premium cigars. That's on the regulatory agenda. Um, and uh, that could be a, a problematic regulation. And then the third one is the uh, standard for manufacturing practices. This would be kind of what we've called track and trace light, um, inspections in foreign factories, um, things like that, uh, that could be pose a challenge for the industry across the board. Now, I say that with the backdrop of um, we could have a December uh, surprise uh, of a favorable ruling by the appellate court in um, the decision on the regulation of premium cigars and the deeming rule. Now, if you recall, we won that case. Um, at the district level, it's the FDA appealed and oral arguments took place about two months ago, three months ago at this point. Um, 
and you know over a three panel judge in the district of columbia uh the appellate level so we're awaiting that decision now if uh the cigar uh, a cigar meets the eight point definition um and the disqualifiers are probably the easier ones to to rattle off um, you know, it has to be whole leaf tobacco, vegetable, gum, and water, the three components of a premium cigar, but no flavoring, no additives, um, wood tips, um, and also it cannot be machine made. So, um, you know, we factor that this would encompass 80 to 85% of most humidors, but we have a lot of members that sell flavored cigars um, that this wouldn't impact. So, We've been filing comments and, and uh, objecting to things that the FDA has been doing, um, recognizing that it could potentially some of these things affect premium cigars in the future and for all these other categories that we know that some of our retail members are selling. Uh, another point in that is pipe tobacco. Uh, we've been uh, voicing uh, concerns with the uh, regulatory stuff that the FDA is putting out that would encompass pipe tobacco. Um, the now a, a Trump administration. Uh, the biggest concern, I think, is the tariffs. Um, you know, I think that uh, if you look at that, what would um, be subject to these tariffs? I think a case can be made that um, premium cigars. Um, by and large, cannot be produced um, at a large scale enough for demand in the United States alone. I know we have some great factories that are are, are still thriving in the U.S., um, but you know the United States is importing nearly 400 million cigars, so things would have to be adjusted. Plus, our um, you know the effects of this on the Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, and Honduras. Um, the industry has good quality paying jobs, has built infrastructure over the years. You take that away, um, you have the exacerbation of, of migration issues and things like that. So we think we will be able to push back a little bit on the, the, the tariff side, but that is a, is a credible concern um, if uh, Trump is elected uh, tomorrow or this week. Um you know, the other thing that I would say congressionally, we've been bipartisan. We work with a congressional cigar caucus. Uh, you wouldn't believe, you know, five, six years ago when Glenn and I started, uh, you know, with the Premium Cigar Association, how many people thought cigars were big cigarettes. A lot of this is education. So, you know, come January, whatever Congress looks like, whatever the administration looks like, we are going to be doing 200 plus meetings to make sure people understand what is a premium cigar, what is a premium uh, tobacconist, and um, how the, they are different from other um, you know, verticals that sell tobacco products and other tobacco product categories. Um, you know, the experience in this last Congress, um, House Republicans have been the best for us. But Senate Democrats have actually been better than Senate Republicans. And a lot of that is in terms of who actually consumes the products, um, but also uh, just an interest in the variety of issues. Now, some people, when we go into those offices, might be against tobacco in, in large. That's why you've seen the Premium Cigar Association kind of diversify um, and come at it from a small business angle or a veterans angle and find those commonalities and connections with offices. So we have a, a you know, full service government affairs operation. And I know Glenn's going to talk about some of the state and local challenges, uh, but federally, irrespective of the outcome of the election, um, we, we will be prepared and, um, you know, we'll have to adapt quickly to whatever that outcome looks like. Um, Furthermore, from the association level, I took on um, being the executive director and leading the association about six months ago. We've been doing a lot of new initiatives, new communications initiatives. December, we have a new website rolling out. Um, and we expanded membership a little bit. Um, this is important to note. Uh, we created something called the PCA Alliance. This is for... 
um, basically small businesses that are connected to retail tobacconists. So if you sell to a distillery, a golf course, a gun club, a barber shop, a restaurant, and they want to be informed and contribute what's going on, um, there's an alliance membership offering to them at the small business level and also at the individual level. The individual level is meant for the lawyers, the accountants, uh, the swag makers that are connected to your lounge or your business. So all of these people in the PCA alliance should have some type of vested financial interest in the success of premium tobacco retailing. So um, that's how we kind of differentiate a little bit from our partner, Cigar Rights of America. We support them. We work with them. We have calls with them every week. And, you know, we encourage people to sign up for their membership. And if they meet some of these categories, sign up for our membership as well. Um, you know, we're in the building phase, hopefully with the, uh, the appeal, we'll, you know, win our lawsuit uh, again and defeat the the FDA for the third time. Well, we're actually the fourth time um, now that it's on a, a appeal. And then uh, we're going to be building the war chest and building the grassroots uh, army up. And we feel as though it's going to be a lot more compelling for Glenn and I to go into offices, not only with tobacconists, but people that are connected um, to the trade, you know, for the Kentucky delegation, they might not um, have, for instance, Louisville, Kentucky, they might not have a tobacconist or a PCA member um, in downtown Louisville, but they may have a distillery that sells cigars. So we're trying to grow the pie, grow the um, megaphone, if you will, uh, for advocacy. Uh, but I'll stop there and turn it over to, to Glenn on the, the state side. And if you have any questions, comments, or feedback about government affairs or anything in the association, I will drop my contact information in the chat. Any questions for Josh before we start chatting about the states? <laughs> Very good. Well, with that, we'll roll into the uh, other side of the uh, of the fence. We are getting ready as we speak for the 2025 legislative season. And at the time of year when over 45 state legislatures, 45 out of 50, go into session every January. Um, and to give you a snapshot of, of how we chisel this stuff down, is we have a legislative tracking system that tra triggers anything, smoke, tobacco, cigar, nicotine, any of these trigger words that, that um, appear in lit in legislation. <clears throat> and that's what compels Josh and I to go over three to 6,000 bills per year and chisel those down to the ones that the industry needs to be truly worried about. And this past... 23-24 legislative season, 2023-24 legislative season, that amounted to 499 pieces of legislation. And there was at least one bill in every state in the country. So I don't think the numbers will be much different than that in 2025. Uh, this legislative tracking system is the best tool that we have to be of assistance to you at the state level. And what that amounts to is that it allows us to issue real-time alerts. In real-time alerts, that means that when a bill is filed that affects you either positively or negatively, we're immediately able to, to convey that to your attention. Then, depending on the nature of the legislation, we'll confer with our other association brethren to determine if a petition needs to be issued for that legislation supporting or opposing it. This system makes it very, very simple for you to use and for the consumers of your shops to use in that we have pre-written testimony, petition language, if you will, to legislators and a version for you as a small business and a version for, for the consumer to utilize to, to, to uh, carry out legislative outreach to members. Our system is linked to every legislator in the country, every elected official in the country. 
So if even something comes up at the city hall level, the county level, we can issue a petition through this system uh, to those elected officials that have the most ability to sway the direction of a given piece of legislation. All of that is available to you on cigaraction.org, cigaraction.org. And by the, I think we still have some bills that are lingering this year. You can go to it and see how the system works. We just, I think we still have some bills up from Michigan, uh, Pennsylvania, and a few others, just so you can see how the model works. That's why we urge you, plea, plea with you, to uh, to put cigaraction.org on your store website so that your consumers can sign up to get those alerts at the same time when it's appropriate to bring in the consumer. So all they have to do is to put in their name and their zip code, and it takes care of the rest of the system. The system takes care of the rest of the of the work for them by issuing a, a pre canned message to the to the elected officials of choice. That system allows us to do the grassroots alert, and it allows us to to communicate directly with legislators at any given time. Which brings me to the next piece of the puzzle of how we're here to help you. We are here to facilitate conversations between your shops and legislators to plot strategy on legislation of concern or opportunity. Uh, we've convened that, and it's an interesting part of the country that we're chatting with tonight. And just to, just to give you a few case studies, um, I, Vermont's on, I mean, uh, Montana's on the call. Uh, this 23-24 legislative season, Idaho, Montana and Nevada are all enjoying tax caps for the first time in in their history. Since uh, 1957. What's that? Since 1957, first change. Yeah, cigar taxes since then. And they are absolute case studies in what can happen when shops get involved in the legislative process. It was it's an absolute case study what happened in Idaho, Montana, and Nevada. Uh, with the tax caps that have taken effect over the last course of the last 24 months. <clears throat> During that same period of time, just to give you a couple of, of other examples, it was really a, a collection of shops, or in one case, a single shop, that got cigar bar legislation through their state capitals. North Dakota and Connecticut successfully spearheaded exemptions for their shops to get mixed beverage uh, permitting in their respective state. And just recently, the very first permit in 20 years was was awarded in Connecticut to a cigar shop to have a full-fledged cigar bar. Uh, and our friend Joe said Dupree out in North Dakota, one little cigar shop, one little cigar shop really spearheaded an effort so that she could open up a cigar bar in North Dakota. And with the way the opposition behaved, you would have thought that a cigar bar was going to pop up on every street corner like Starbucks uh, if they passed that bill when she was she, in fact, is the only show in town. And, uh, and even in Connecticut, there's only one permit available for every 80,000 population. So a lot of guardrails have been put on bills like that to demonstrate the uniqueness of this industry. Um uh, so what I want to do now is kind of go through the crystal ball, and in and in your part part of the country, hopefully there's not anticipated a, a great number of bills to be concerned about, but we just want to put a couple of things on your radar screen. I don't anticipate any legislation in the state of Washington, but you can never rule it out in the state of Washington. Um, our friend Joe Arundel at Rain City Cigar for years had tried the legislation to allow for smoking in cigar shops to to again take place in the state of Washington. It's a it's a bill that I wish could be revisited or would be revisited uh, if there's a political appetite for it in the state of Oregon. And I know we have someone on, on in Oregon on on this call. We always have to be cognizant and protecting the the tax cap in Oregon. It's consistently under attack. Uh, it It's one of those things that seemingly always stands out at budget time, and it has to be consistently protected and, and rally the troops with the Oregon retailers to put the word out on why that cap is absolutely critical to your small business uh, success. 
I don't anticipate anything in Idaho or Nevada, Arizona, Montana, or Montana or New Mexico on this list. And if anybody's heard any different than that, please please share that information. We do know that there's going to be a tax ceiling bill, and I don't call it a cap because of the constitutional issues uh, with this issue, but we do know that there's going to be refiled a tax ceiling bill, which amounts to a cap of 20% of the OTP on cigars in the state of Colorado. This bill was filed by Senator Tom Sullivan last year. Um, I was able to meet the senator at this year's Rocky Mountain Cigar Festival, and he's a uh, he's a Democrat in the Colorado State Senate who's a devout cigar smoker. He loves to patron the local cigar shops in Colorado. Uh, he's a fan of this bill. He, he candidly said personally and politically, <laughs> he, uh, he wants that legislation. And we told him that even if he thinks it's a long shot in the Colorado legislature, there's so much political value in just having that bill exist to bring attention to the extraordinarily high level of taxation in Colorado. As uh, since it's being recorded and distributed to the retailers throughout the state of Colorado, um, this is about the constitutional referendum that was held because in Colorado, they've kind of gone California in that tax issues have to be put to a public referendum and they're not, they're, they are not solely in the hands of the legislature and a tax increase passed to fund the governor's K-12 through program. And I think it's this January that the OTP goes to 65%. And it's been on a gradual escalation from, I think, 50% uh, of wholesale, and it was scheduled to go up again. And uh, it's, a, it's a real plight that you have to go through uh, a referendum to, to address a tax issue tax issue of that nature. But the way that Senator Sullivan has crafted this bill, it makes it constitutional by calling it a tax ceiling. And uh, for that, we're very grateful to the senator. We think we, there's a member of the uh, Colorado House who's also a Democrat who's willing to sponsor the bill that was also at the Rocky Mountain Cigar Festival. And we look forward to working with the retailers and with the legislators on that on that legislation. State of California, um, we can't rule out the generational smoking ban legislation being refiled in California. Um, it was, as everyone knows, originally proposed in New Zealand. It has gone to Europe. It is pending in the House, but with the conservatives and the liberals in England. It proves what how bad ideas spread in the world of tobacco control. Uh, there's been numerous. Uh, Attempts and rhetoric about it coming back in California. I don't think we can rule it out being filed. Um, the the ways of California are famous in the way they address tobacco control. I saw where Santa Cruz, California, in the last week has now banned anything that you can smoke with filters. So obviously that's more than just cigarettes. It brings in little cigars, little filtered cigars. Uh, it's just another notch in the stick of the, in the world of tobacco control. And also the the flavor ban rule in California is also creatively interpreted by local governments, and local governments are tr are in some ways trying to supersede that of the state on the flavor ban front in California, um, which brings me to another issue that it could could spread throughout other parts of the western states, and that is the flavored tobacco ban. Some of these bills are written so broadly that they can bring in flavored descriptors, which brings in constitutional issues on speech. But as we all know, when you read reviews of cigars and you say notes of cinnamon and, you know, you, you get the picture. Uh, that doesn't mean there's cinnamon in it. Uh, just like, you know, cherry might, it might be notes of cherry and wine, but there's no cherries in it. Same principle. Sometimes these bills are written so broadly that they bring that nuance into the debate. And that's the reason we are, we consistently are going on record against these flavored tobacco bans. And lastly, in the state of Wyoming, I had a conversation earlier today uh, with the retail community in Wyoming, and we're hoping to bring back a tax cap bill there. 
We've got a friendly member of the Senate who's very public in his support of the industry, Senator Pappas of Wyoming. Um, so we're going to be talking with our uh, f fellow industry associations about the likelihood and the ability to bring that legislation back. Um, are there any questions about anticipated kind of the crystal ball look at legislation in the states? Or maybe if somebody on this has heard uh, of anything differently or, or the like that we should be concerned about. Any questions about 